Uh, last week we, um, we kicked off a mini-series called We Are the Church, meaning it's you and I, uh, it's the redeemed people of God, not a building or a curriculum as amazing as those things are, as uh, they are a necessity for us, but the church is the redeemed people of God. And we looked at a passage of Scripture that told us how we are to uh, go about as the church of God, and we saw that we are to be a people who are devoted, devoted to the gospel, uh, devoted to God's word, devoted to each other, devoted to prayer and praise. Become a people or a faith family or a faith community where Jesus can move, where Jesus can have his way and even add to our numbers for his glory and for the extension of his kingdom. And so I was, I don't know about you, I was pretty excited after last Sunday. Uh, we got some pretty good feedback about our, our physical move here, but, but more so just a, an expectant heart of what Jesus is going to be doing in us and through us in this, this new chapter here. But then I woke up on Monday morning with a bit of a nagging question. It's like, what is the rest of the church worldwide doing? How are our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world? How, how are they doing? And so I did some digging, and, and what I found was, was not all that encouraging. And so I, I want to share some of those findings with you. And then we're going to look at a, a portion of Scripture that I think is a, a pretty good remedy to the state of the church and the state of the world. Uh, pew as in church pew. Uh, what they do is they just go and do surveys um, around the world, gather data around the world in terms of how the church is doing uh, and things like that. And so according to a 2019 survey, okay, so before COVID, before things went all crazy, this was kind of normal. Uh, according to a 2019 survey by Pew Research, around 65% of American adults identify as Christians down from 77% in 2009. It says, the decline has been more pronounced among young adults, with just 49% of millennials identifying as Christians compared to 85% of the silent generation. You ever heard of the silent generation? Exactly. They're so, they're so quiet. No, I don't, know. I don't know who the silent generation was, and then I found out it's those born between 1928 and 1945. All right. No one here. That they really are quiet. The same survey found that attendance at religious services has declined in recent years, with just 36% of U.S. adults reporting that they attend religious services at least once a week, down from 41% in 2009. Meanwhile, the number of Americans who say they seldom or never attend religious services has increased from 27% in 2009 to 35% in 2019. And then I thought, well, okay, wait, 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 what about the, the, the church in, in Western Europe? And at some stage in church history, Western Europe was one of the most prolific regions to send missionaries out all over the world. I mean, you think of William Carey uh, from England. He was known as the, the, uh, the father, of modern mission, of, uh, father of modern missions. He went to India. David Livingston from Scotland. He was a medical missionary. He went uh, off to Africa, spent most of his life in Africa. George Mueller was known as a prayer warrior. Uh, a Amy Carmichael was an Irish missionary. He served in India for 56 years and never never ever returned home. So just a, f a phenomenal, uh, rich heritage of missionaries. Well, again, according to Pew Research, Western Europe is now considered a secular region. This article says Western Europe, where Protestant Christianity originated and Catholicism um, has been based for most of its history, has become one of the world's most secular regions. And this was pretty interesting. Uh, although the vast majority of adults say they were baptized, today many do not describe themselves as Christians. Some say they gradually drifted away from religion, stopped believing in religious teachings, or were alienated by scandals or church positions on social issues, which I'm guessing has a lot to do with the sexual revolution that we are in. But then what Pew Research did was they, they pressed a little bit harder and they went and they asked two questions around Western Europe. And they said, uh, do you believe in the Bible and do you believe in God as described in the Bible? And they came up with some pretty interesting stats. Uh, so this was across 15 countries in Western Europe. And so the general population in Western Europe across those 15 countries said this. 27% said they believe in God as described in the Bible. 38% believe in another higher power. 
So it can include Jesus, it can include all sorts of various gods, kind of like a pluralistic thought on spirituality and atheism. Then they, they've, they found two other groups, and the other group is um, church-attending Christians. That is, if you uh, belong to a particular faith community and you go to a church service at least once a month. You have some pretty interesting stats. 64% said they believe in God as described in the Bible. 32% believe in another higher power or other higher powers. So these are Christians who are going to church. Now, I don't know what they're teaching them uh, if they're saying that they believe in other higher powers. 2% of Christians who go to church don't believe in God. So I don't know what that means. I, I, I mean, A, I'm hoping that they're going to seek and find out if there is a God, or those churches have really, really good coffee, and they're like, I don't care what that guy says, we're here for the coffee. I don't know. Anyway, then there's the non-practicing Christians. Those uh, are people who um, identify themselves in the culture. It's kind of like a cultural marker as a Christian, but they do not attend any service uh, or affiliated to any particular church at all. 24% say they believe in God as described in the Bible. 51% believe in another higher power or higher powers, and 16% do not believe in any higher power at all which is interesting that they would still then describe themselves as a Christian. So, some pretty sobering stats, but we also need to keep our perspective on these things. For instance, when we read in the book of Acts, which is a, a divinely inspired documentation of the early church, we read about how it exploded in the beginning. We saw in, in Acts 2 last week uh, when the church uh, when the church began, it, you know, 3,000 people were saved right off the bat. And then Luke uh, records in chapter 4 of the book of Acts that it grew by another 5,000. And then by the time he writes chapter 6, he's just like done with counting. He's like, one, two, never mind. He just says this, God's word spread and the number of disciples grew rapidly throughout Jerusalem, Acts 6 verse 7. And so if Pew Research was around at that stage and they had to do a, a survey, the stats would be pretty amazing. Like, this is exploding, this is amazing. And then Luke goes on to tell us that persecution breaks out. Uh, Stephen was the first martyr, followed by James, one of Jesus' original disciples. And this causes the church to flee Jerusalem, the, the, to, to scatter. And we're not sure of the numbers, but we're guessing the numbers are in the thousands. Now again, if Pew Research had to have done a survey at that stage, I'm sure they would have come up with some pretty interesting stats. They might have even included like these articles that the church in Jerusalem was dying. Maybe this was even the end of Christianity itself. But then here you and I are, some 2,000 odd years later, in a school gymnasium uh, on a little patch of sand in the middle of the Caribbean, praising our Lord and Savior. We're doing what millions and millions of brothers and sisters in Christ are doing right now around the world. What millions of brothers and sisters in Christ have been doing for centuries and centuries. So on the one hand, we can rest in the fact that Jesus is not done with his church. He is building his church. He says so in Matthew 16, 18. But then on the other hand, that we as the church, we have to realize that we play a part in this mission. As the redeemed people of God, we are to participate in the mission of building Jesus' church. And so that's what I want us to have a look at briefly this morning, that as the church, we are missional. As the church, we are missional. So again, I want you to read a very well-known passage with me, and then we will get stuck in and understand what exactly our role in this mission is. So it's Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. It says this, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the context of this passage is that Jesus has conquered the grave and he summons his disciples to this particular mountain where he commissions them. And I believe he commissions us as well as believers because as believers we are also disciples to be a part of this mission. 
to be a part of his mission. And it's very important that we understand it that way. We can say it like this. The mission has a church, not the church has a mission. Jesus has always been doing what he has been doing, and that he's redeeming for himself a people, a church. We saw this at the end of our passage last week, Acts 2 verse 47, where Luke says, The Lord added to them daily those who were being saved. And the church played a, a role in that. All right, remember, Peter got up and he, he, he delivered his very first sermon, a radically gospel-centered sermon, and then the church uh, was devoted to the things of God. But at the end of the day, Jesus was adding to his church. It's his mission. And so what exactly then is our role in it? And we can sum it up like this. The mission of the church, the mission of you and I, is to make disciples of all nations. And I think if we can truly grasp what that means, we will see those stats change. And I'll show you what I mean as we make our way through this passage. So we can tackle it like this. As a missional church, we make disciples under the authority of Jesus, of all nations, and then we will finish with in the presence of Jesus. So here we go. Number one, uh, we, as a missional church, we make disciples under the authority of Jesus. And this wasn't immediately clear to all of the disciples. And I think this is the problem with the church today and most certainly around the world is that we don't quite realize or understand the authority that Jesus has and therefore that is depicted in our lives. We then you know, begin to look to other things, to, to have an influence, to have a say in what we are to believe in, in our world views, and that then begins to affect how we see church and how we practice church. It will affect our devotion as we looked at last week. So here's what I mean. Look at verse 16 again. It says this. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And this is the two typical reactions we see continue throughout the ages toward Jesus. We see this revealed in our stats. There are those around the world who've come to a, we can say, a grace-enabled conviction as to who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross for them, and this results in a life of worship to him. And it's not to say that you, know, you don't go through moments of doubt or seasons of doubt, but you know in your heart of hearts, in your core, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And then there's this camp of doubters in, the, in their various forms. There are those who begin with doubt and, and they wrestle with all of these questions in hope of, of, of founding answers and coming to true faith in Jesus. Then there are others, I believe, who falsely call themselves Christians by affirming all sorts of other deities and higher powers, meaning they uh, disagree with Jesus' exclusive statement that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. Then there are others whose doubt simply progresses to out-and-out -out atheism. But the good news is that in all three cases or any other forms of doubt, no one is a lost cause because of what Jesus does and says next. He clarifies and he proves that he has all authority. Look at verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so what Jesus is doing here, he's demonstrating that he is in fact God. He says that this authority has been given to him. It's been given to him by the one, his father, who raised him from the grave. The fact that he is standing there is proof that he has this, this authority and therefore proof that he must be God. Uh, and this authority is over two realms, he says, the physical realm and the spiritual realm. I mean, he's standing there in the flesh, demonstrating that he has authority over the spiritual realm because it couldn't keep him from coming back to the physical realm. And then, furthermore, the physical realm cannot keep him because soon he will ascend into heaven, into the spiritual realm. And so he's demonstrating he has this authority over these two particular realms. The problem with this um, as humanity, and even some in the church, is that we, we recoil at the idea of Jesus having all supreme authority. The foundation of 
humanity's sinful nature is a rebellion toward God, which is exhibited primarily in us wanting to have our all supreme authority, complete autonomy from God. And we've seen this so clearly in our journey through the Gospel of Mark. We've seen it in the Pharisees, a power struggle with Jesus. You know, they're, they're losing their authority, they're losing their status, they're losing their allegiance with all the people who are praising Jesus for everything He says and does. And so this culminates in Jesus' arrest and crucifixion on the cross. But because Jesus has authority over all things, including this very gross sin, his, his crucifixion, it plays right into His hand. The crucifixion of Jesus at the hands of prideful, sinful people becomes the very means of the world's salvation. So by looking at the cross, we can take incredible encouragement from any rebellion or hard-heartedness that we see in this world, that we come across in this world, whether it be within our own families, um, at work, with our colleagues, or even within the church. Because Jesus has conquered the cross, which seemingly looked like His demise, but it was, in fact, the bringing about of the salvation of the world. So therefore, there's no one who is beyond Him. No one is beyond Jesus' reach. And so we can look at these stats, and, and on a very earthly, surfacey level, they look very uh, alarming, and they look very disheartening. But you and I, we can have hope and know that on a, on a very far deeper level, that Jesus is still very much in control, and that He is up to something in this world. And so we can say to Adam and the missionary team going off to Honduras or to Lee and Jen and Lurica and Kruger, go, guys, go. Go in the full confidence that Jesus has authority over you. Full confidence that he has authority over you, which then leads us to our responsibility as the church as those who are under the all-supreme authority of Jesus, what then is our role specifically in this mission? So number two, uh, as a missional church, we make disciples of all nations. Look at verse 19. It says, Go therefore, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so we, we have a very large task ahead of us. The, um, the nations are our mission field, and the nations here, uh, Jesus does not mean countries, your geographical country. No, he means ethno-linguistic people groups. And according to the latest uh, 2021, 24th edition of Ethnologue, uh, which is this comprehensive database um, of the world's languages, it says there are approximately 7,100 living languages, spoken languages in the world. And these languages, the article says, are spoken by a diverse range of ethnic and linguistic, ling linguistic groups, which number in the tens of thousands. It says it's important to note that these estimates are constantly evolving as languages and cultures change over time. And, and again, that, that might sound like a very daunting, never-ending mission or task, but Jesus would never have told us to go. He would never have told His church to go if, he didn't ha if His authority wasn't comprehensive enough. Meaning, yes, let's, let's go to Honduras. Let's go to Ireland, let's go to the Philippines, let's go to Sweden, let's go to Afghanistan, let's go to North Korea, you name it. Because the authority of Jesus surpasses all earthly and spiritual strongholds everywhere, we can go. Whether it be polytheism, atheism, Islam, Hinduism, New Age, on and on the list can go. He has supreme authority. But now you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, Jason. Uh, in certain countries, Christian missionaries have been martyred for their faith. So where exactly was Jesus' authority in those situations? And it's a fair question, and the answer might surprise you. But the authority of Jesus is in the martyrdom. Just have a look at this briefly. Revelation 6 from verse 9. And remember, Revelation is, is a vision the, the Apostle uh, John has, particularly regarding the end times. And he says this, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne, missionaries in other words. 
And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. I love that. Until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So Jesus, in his absolute sovereignty, in his absolute control over all things, he has a complete number of those who will be martyred or as witnesses for him. And in the meantime, those wondering if Jesus will avenge their death are given white robes, which depicts purity, and they're given rest, meaning they have completed their mission. They have received the words that every single Christian longs to hear, and that is, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy or the rest of your master. And then the rest of the book of Revelation is an unfolding of how Jesus will execute judgment for his slain missionaries. In fact, Tertullian, who was an early church father, is famously quoted as saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Meaning, the more you kill us, the more we multiply. Because there is one who has more authority than our persecutors. Jesus also clarifies for us what this mission is to be about, and this is so vitally important for us. So we are the church, and so, so what are we to be about? What is our purpose? What is your purpose for, for being here? If life is better with Jesus in glory, why doesn't he just simply beam us up to be with him the moment we profess faith in him? It's because he wants us to be involved in his mission. And, the purpose that he is, and that purpose is to specifically make disciples. He says, go. Go to all ethnic groups and make disciples. We can say a biblical definition of a disciple is this. It's very wordy. It says, someone who follows and is learning from Jesus, is striving to be like Jesus, to love others as Jesus loves others, is willing to give up everything to follow Jesus, and is committed to making more disciples by teaching and sharing the gospel. John Mark Comer slims it down to just three words. Be, become, do. Be with Jesus so as to become like Jesus, so as to do like Jesus. And I think as the church, we've we've kind of lost the point of our mission. Our mission is not just simply to make converts, although conversion is where everything begins and starts. A a, a convert to Christianity is like a newborn baby, and a newborn baby, as we know, needs constant love, attention, and and nourishment. And what Jesus is about to do do now is unpack uh, and give us information on how to love the newborn Christian, how to give them attention and nourishment so that they grow up into a strong disciple of his. So it involves three things, he says, making or evangelizing, number two, baptizing and teaching. Making, like I said, involves this process of evangelizing or sharing the gospel, telling people the amazing news of who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross for them. And then to trust that as they're sharing the gospel, the authority of Jesus over all things through the Holy Spirit kind of blows in and regenerates their heart so that they can repent of their sin and believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But I know that this sounds, this is, this is the daunting part, right? This is the scary part. And so I always encourage people, just, just, just start off small. Begin with prayer. Ask the Lord to put someone on your heart, put a colleague on your heart if he hasn't done that already, and just commit to praying for them. According to the Gospel of John, God draws people. And so ask that God would begin to draw this person to himself and that he would use you in that process. And then secondly, drop little hints that you are a Christian if they don't know it already. You know, hey, I got into such an interesting conversation yesterday at church about interest rates. And carry on with the conversation. If they didn't know you were a Christian, the only thing they would have heard was, hey, you go to church. And then maybe they wouldn't say anything in the moment, but maybe later they would come and begin to ask you questions about your faith or about your church. 
Or if you get invited to dinner on a Wednesday night and say, hey, I, I would love to come, but my community group meets on a Wednesday night. Um, how about Thursday night or, or next week? And they might not understand what a community group is, and so you can explain to them what that's all about. But at the same time, it communicates how important your faith is to you and your faith community. But at the same time, that you still want to be with them. And then thirdly, when it comes to sharing the gospel, don't feel you have to give this entire theological thesis on the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. Just share your story wrapped in the gospel. In other words, how has the gospel impacted your life? Can you answer that question? And the cool part here is that this is, this is the part we can actually prepare. You know, as you drive home uh, after church, you can go, well, how would I answer that question? How has the gospel changed my life? And have an idea of what you would say so that you can do that when you're, when you're asked. And then, Lord willing, at some point they come to faith in Jesus. And then we move on to step two of the discipleship process, and that is we baptize them. And this is what I'm so excited about us doing um, <clears throat> in a moment or two. Baptism, along with the Lord's Supper, is, uh, uh, or, or communion, are two sacraments or two ceremonies that the Lord tells us to uh, obey and adhere to. Baptism symbolizes our conversion. You know, going down into the water symbolizes the washing away of our sins and our old sinful self and the reception of forgiveness. And coming back up uh, symbolizes our new life in Jesus, our newfound, redeemed life in Jesus. It's a public declaration to the world, to everyone, that we now belong to Jesus. We no longer belong under the lordship of self or this world, but to his lordship, under his lordship. Now, we are part of a faith family, and we have a new purpose and a new meaning in life. Now, if you remember from that article I read, um, it said that many professing Christians in Western Europe said that they were baptized and now no longer want to put their foot in a church or be affiliated with a, a Christian faith community. And if we're going to avoid that particular stat, it's, it's imperative that we apply step three of the, of the discipleship process. Jesus goes on and says, teaching them, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So if we are going to be like Jesus or, or be with Jesus, so as to become like Jesus and do like Jesus, we need to be lifelong students of his word. In fact, Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, that his Father would sanctify us by the truth. And he then identifies that God's word is the truth. Sanctify means to be, means to be set apart. So as disciples of Jesus, we need to be set apart from the ways of this world to the way of Jesus. The fact that 32% of church participating Christians and 51% of professing Christians who don't attend a church service of sorts in Western Europe don't believe in God as described in the Bible tells us that something horribly has gone wrong in the discipleship process. And I'm willing to bet it's stage three, the teaching of God's word. Because notice Jesus says that we're, we're not simply to teach for information, but transformation. He says, teaching them to observe, teaching them to apply, to obey. His word serves no purpose if we don't apply it to our lives. Toward the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he said that if we heard but, not, but didn't obey his word, we would be like the fool who, who built his house on the sand. And then when the winds and the storms of life hit, it fell flat. It crashed. And I'm wondering, is that, is that what's happening in Western Europe and the States? Kind of like the storms of progressive the theology and liberal theology are taking out disciples of Jesus because we're, we're not walking with them from, uh, con from conversion to baptism to becoming lifelong learners of, of God's sanctifying word. But the good news is, if we are teaching for transformation, and if you're learning for transformation, Jesus said in that same passage, we would be like the man who built his house on the rock. And when the winds came and the storms came, it did not fall, it did not crash. And so that's our mission, Sunrise. I want us to be disciples built on the rock. And I want us to make disciples who are built on the rock. 
But it requires one more key factor. And this is probably the most comforting factor being on mission with Jesus. Uh, in fact, without this, this one, I don't think I would have survived as a disciple, uh, never mind being on mission. And that is, as a missional church, we make disciples in the presence of Jesus. Now, uh, between my wife and I, uh, she's uh, the, far more the adrenaline junkie than I am. And uh, when we were just recently in South Africa, she came up with this wonderful idea that we should go and parasail. Uh, that's kind of like when you run, jump off a mountain, and hope that the sail lifts you up to soar with the eagles and not plummet down to the earth. And now, uh, you know, being a man uh, full of unredeemed pride and ego, uh, how could I say no? So there we were on this blissful, beautiful day on top of a mountain in Sedgefield, South Africa, with about a, another hundred adrenaline junkies all waiting to defy God's law of gravity and self-preservation. And so I uh, went off and I introduced myself to my pilot, Dion, who my very life was literally going to be strapped to. And I began a little covert interview with him, uh, like, um, you know, covering topics like, have you done this before? Um, how long have you been doing this for? Have you ever lost anyone? Have you ever killed anyone before? Uh, fortunately, I didn't have to answer that, um, ask that last question because he was very understanding. He gave me his very long resume that he's been flying uh, for like 30 odd years. He has the highest level of qualification. He's flown all around Africa, if not the world. And the more he spoke, the less anxious I became uh, to the point when he said, okay, it's time to now run off the mountain. I actually obeyed. Um, to say run, maybe it was more like, you know, with weak knees, more like a duck waddle, but I ran off the edge of the mountain and we dropped like rocks, only to come shooting up to this height that I can describe as terrifying and exhilarating all at the same time. In fact, the, all of the other parasailers, including my wife, who was bored, uh, were like little um, ants down below us, and, um, but with Dion's very cool, calm, and gentle presence and voice, you know, he calmed me down to the point where I actually began to enjoy everything around me. Uh, we'll even show you this picture, if it can come up. There we go. Um, you can see I'm, I'm kind of like reaching out at one point, uh, reaching out for Jesus or my mom, one of the two. Um, but the more we flew around, the more Dion explained to me what he was doing and showing me amazing things, the more I calmed down and actually began to enjoy everything around me. Um, I will leave the descent to another illustration. But the point that I'm trying to make is this, and then I'm done. Our mission to go and make disciples of all nations might sound very scary, very daunting, like running off the edge of a mountain. Like, will I sink? Will I drop like a rock? What if, I, what if I stumble over my words? What if they laugh at me? What if I'm canceled by my colleagues? Sunrise, let's not let the what ifs of life rule our lives, but let the promises of Jesus rule our lives. And this is what Jesus says right at the end. He says, and behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. The New Living Translation interprets behold as, and be sure of this. Be sure of the fact that Jesus, who, who has authority over all things, a spiritual realm and a physical realm, is with you to the end of the age. He is always with us. You can be sure that he goes with you to brunch today. You can be sure that he goes with you to work tomorrow, to your board meeting. He'll be with you in your phone call to your brother or your sister who doesn't know Jesus. Uh, you can be sure that he's with you when you drop hints about your faith or you share your gospel-centered story. You can be sure that he is building his church no matter what the stats say, no matter what the world says. So sunrise, let's go make disciples. Let's go make them in this, under this constant awareness that the all supreme authority of Jesus is with us everywhere we go. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray. I want to pray one more time for our missionaries who are on their way to, who, who will be on their way on Friday, and to pray for us. 
that we would know the presence of Jesus. So won't you bow your heads with me? Jesus, I, I don't know how to preach and teach your presence. That's just something you have to show us, Jesus. I'm asking, would you, would you make us all aware of that amazing fact that you are right here with us right now? And some of us might feel distracted. But I'm asking you right now, would you make us aware of your presence? And to know, to know who you are, that you have all authority in heaven and on earth. And we have the awesome privilege of knowing you and going everywhere with you, knowing that you are with us. I pray that that brings comfort to all of us, but I pray it also gives us a sense of boldness to go like none, be, none other before and go to our places of work tomorrow and to be bold to share things about our faith, to share the gospel, that knowing that you're with us would give us a heart for people to come into our faith family to know you. So I, I pray again for Adam and the missionary team. May they know that you are going with them. In fact, you've gone, gone ahead of them. And may they walk and step with you. Thank you that you have all authority and you will protect them. Father, we want to pray now for our time of baptism down at the beach. Again, that we would be aware of you as we are obeying one of your sacraments to be baptized. We trust it to bring joy to your heart and joy in that moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Am I standing one last time?